I was talking about twisting and we'll come back to this subject. Uh, as you can see, and it is a fashion already, many architects employ it and some of the most important architects today, twist, twist, twist. And this to me shows a, a crisis and uh, a disbelief uh, or a, a diluted belief in, in uh, prismatic uh, undisturbed conditions. And I, I see it as a, some kind of a crisis of reason. And this is a reaction where you modify, you distort, you twist a prism that otherwise might seem too serene. It could also be an expression of some kind of pessimism that we don't believe any longer in, uh, in, in the workings of reason alone. Uh, of course, we had deconstruction, which manifested that disbelief in its own way. But the twisting is an uh, interesting aspect today. So we'll return to this. Um, there you see in the image here on the left, uh, the new World Trade Center built by, not by Lipskin. He won the competition, but it was David Child from SOM. Not only twisting, but you also have a pair of twisted uh, towers. And, and this is another interesting um, uh, leitmotif that, that, that uh, uh, we, we are confronted with, so to speak, these days. Maybe in the, the unconscious, the subconscious, or the subliminal uh, uh, mind of architecture, or the, the, the community of architects, uh, the World Trade Center, the former World Trade Center is still present. So maybe here I, I speculate, of course, maybe, maybe wrongly, but you have two towers which are embracing, holding each other and also contorted. So maybe a, a, an appropriate paradigm for New York City in the post-September 11 um, uh, period of time. And the contortions, uh, the, the twisting is to be seen also uh, inside. Now, Terform, which is a, a, an interesting architecture office. It's a non-for-profit kind of organization. In a way, an avant-garde enterprise. They don't work for men, for human beings. They work for insects, if you can believe it. They, they, they do an architecture that is like this one is uh, it's an experiment of course it's in a way an installation a pavilion but the concern is not with the human beings but with what is outside of the human beings uh, insects uh, animals uh, bushes you name it and um, of course they struggle financially because they depend on donations with this kind of preoccupations but i, I chose to to show it because it does show a, a, a significant change in our concerns that we are already talking about the post-Anthropocene, a, a post-man uh, new era, uh, because indeed the human being uh, disturbed nature, disturbed the, the, the order, uh, the climatic order even. And now we, we, we somehow we try to reconsider and to become uh, more aware of what is outside of us. So the human being perhaps is not perceived any longer as the center or the, or the shepherd of, uh, of uh, being, of existence. The, it, it's a shift that is taking place and, and now there are just maybe, you know, isolated, uh, um, you know, suggestions of this, but it seems to be I mean, it would have been inconceivable even just some years ago that a team of architects would dedicate themselves to studying insects. You know, I mean, Ernst Neufer would have remained without a job because obviously his manual of, of architecture or of the architect is totally irrelevant to the life of the, of the insects or uh, uh, animals. Now you see a building by Frank Gehry who had to build in uh, New York City as well. Uh, it was a must. You probably know these towers. I, I don't think uh, they are the best works by him, but I chose to, to show it because it's still Frank Gehry and he still problematizes the, 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 the placid box or the placid uh, prism by, uh, uh, by these fluctuations, these fluidities on the facade he still had to conform with a, 
with a kind of verticality that is almost unavoidable in New York City, but he problematizes it through these waves, architectural waves, if I could call them so. Another symptom that, that unreason, or uh, yeah, if we could call it so, unreason is making its way onto the works of reason. And uh, you could even almost call it the, the revenge of Bernini, because you probably know that uh, Frank Gehry was inspired by the great uh, Baroque um, Roman artist uh, Bernini. So, of course, he is not the only one, but even here we have a form of twisting. Even here we have a critical uh, uh, positioning vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the rational box or the rational prism. There is also the Agua Tower in Chicago by Ginny Gang, the studio gang, which also uh, uh, brought fluidity into the, um, the you know, reasonable or uh, rational box. And there are other architects as well. Med architects also built the two towers, the Marilyn Monroe Towers in, in Canada, Canada, also twisted and, 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 uh, and um, you know, with, with fluidities that would have been inconceivable maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. But this is, uh, this is Frank Gehry. It was built a few years ago, but look at the facade. This is a, I mean, it is an attempt at, at, at uh, uh, implementing a Baroque mentality into, into a city which in a certain way is Baroque, but in a very different way. Um, uh, Baroque art or Baroque architecture per se, as, as, as we encounter it in Europe, is not uh, easily found in, in Manhattan, but in a, in a modern interpretation, here we have these buildings. Too bad that uh, actually the, the silhouette, the, the, the perimeter line of the building is roughly still of a, of a, of a prism. So you could, you, could, you could say that maybe these uh, fluidities are more of a cosmetical order than, a, you know, uh, but, but the constraints in your city are probably very, very stringent. So that's what he was able to do. Now, uh, a firm that is very successful now, uh, dealers, Cofidio and Renfro, the first two I actually knew, they, they, uh, Scofidio was a, a professor at Cooper Union in, in New York, a very good uh, architecture school. The only school in the United States that I know of where you didn't have to pay tuition, but you had to pass through a, a difficult exam. Uh, so, you know, talents and uh, people with a certain level of intelligence uh, got in. Dealer was his uh, student and uh, then they fell in love and, 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 and then they began to have uh, increasing success. And Renfro is the partner uh, who came afterwards. The, the amount of works they have to do needed perhaps three partners, not just two. This is a building uh, that that uh, attempts to 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 e even this building attempts to break the box to to contribute to the life of the city and the life of of the street by opening up on one side. Essentially, it is a box which which is is broken uh, on the on the short elevation, I mean the narrow elevation, and and then the staircase becomes actually a, a public architectural event and space. It becomes, you know, even an auditorium on, 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 the, uh, on the floors at the bottom and then other spaces. In other words, they, it's a hybrid architecture. They try to, uh, uh, to destroy the idea that the staircase is just a staircase. Here you have the platforms between the um, uh, the ramps uh, that become other spaces for other functions. So I think it's a it's a it's an, uh, a legitimate attempt, and uh, um, it opens us uh, it opens up and you can see behind it's kind of a regular box architectural box, but as it approaches the street, uh, it, it it opens up so it shows its uh, visceral truth in a way if if we can say so. They are adventurous and of course it pays off. 
because in a competitive society, if you take risks, yes, you might lose, but you could also attract attention. And uh, you know, if you are lucky a little bit, uh, you know, you, you could you could have the chance to build, uh, uh, you know, buildings that uh, require courage. I mean, if you compare this building to the ones on the left and the ones on the right, you can see what a difference. I mean, they, they are sophisticated architects, you know, they're very involved with academia. Dealer was, I think, the director of architecture program at Princeton for many years. Uh, Scofidio taught, and uh, they both taught at Cooper Union. So they, they, we are dealing here with a New York uh, elite, so to speak, in, in architectural terms. Now, Stephen Hall. Uh, Stephen Hall, who was our guest, uh, we had the chance two weeks ago to have him participate uh, on uh, uh, one of, of the first uh, Zoom talks. Uh, here, he came to pay homage to his friend who died, Lebia Suds, uh, who died in 2012. Also present two weeks ago was Wolf Fricks from Vienna. They didn't uh, say much, but they were present. And um, I was grateful because because of them, 250 people or so showed up uh, to to these um, Zoom meetings. Uh, to this Zoom meeting, and this is this is the so this is the function, a Campbell Sports Center uh, in the Bronx, I think it is. Uh, it's a typical uh, Stephen Hall building in a way. Uh, well, I shouldn't say typical because his buildings are not. And he even avoids what is called uh, signature architecture. Although, if you are familiar with his work, you do see certain elements which are, uh, you know, uh, uh, belong to him. But uh, he, it's true, he is not a signature architect per se. And he, he reinvents himself with every program. You will also see a library that was just uh, finished uh, very recent, uh, recently. In, uh, in in Queens by him. In this building as well, you see this attempt to break the box, to bring the stair outside. So the there is an intermediate space between the inside of the building and the outside of the building. So this transitional uh, space is important because it it connects the building with uh, what is outside of it. And I would say this is also true at the level of our own lives, that, that uh, 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 introversion has its qualities, but also it is important to open up to other people, to society, to life, to the street, and so on. As you know, Stephen Hall begins his day uh, with, uh, with uh, drawing uh, himself with watercolors and studying, uh, you know, through various sketches, ideas, uh, explores, he explores ideas through these watercolors. Uh, he probably has a large collection of, of such uh, watercolors. And it is amazing considering how much he builds that he still so-called finds time, he makes time to draw with his own hand, to make these watercolors and, and explore the anatomy of the building and the various ideas. I, I admire this. Much lesser architects don't do this, but he does it. And uh, it's not a little thing, I think. And you see the duality, mind-body. Again, mind-body. You know, this is not just an athletic center, but it is a building that tries to bring together the mind with the body. 
and this holistic approach to not just architecture but life i think i, I think it is valuable Now, Jean Nouvel. Well, Jean Nouvel uh, also built, uh, and now he probably finished a skyscraper that belongs to museum, the Museum of Modern Art. But I will start with an apartment building, this one. Across the street is a building by Frank Gehry. I like more the building by Nouvel. I like, you see here is a different kind of, uh, of uh, opposing in a way the straight predictable, uh, regularity of the rational box because the facade is pixelated uh, the windows are so very different and uh, it's actually a puzzle you know is a, is a, uh, yeah it, it's a puzzle so it shows in a different way the the problem problematization of reason of the cartesian mentality and the cartesian box Uh, what a difference no, between the building at the bottom and what he did behind. It's also a, a quest for complexity because it's true, today's life is very complex. Of course, you could uh, situate yourself uh, uh, um, uh, in opposition and, and, and opposed to the complexity of today's life, you know, uh, some kind of a refuge a fortress of peace, but it depends. Uh, I guess uh, valuable architecture could be done with an opposite uh, mentality as well. Although I think that somehow to, be, to belong to your time and to, to your place, you cannot ignore uh, the specificity, specificities that uh, define that time and that place. He's not a deconstructivist per se. Jean Nouvel never was and probably never will. But there is here in this fragmentation some kind of so-called, with quotation marks, uh, deconstruction. This fracturing, this, this culture, this aesthetic culture of fragments, of fractals. Now this is the tower uh, built by him and I unfortunately I, I, I don't have very uh, I, I have uh, pictures from one year ago when it was during the construction it's a gothic tower it's very surprising to me that that um, Jean Nouvel uh, proposed what I would call a gothic tower uh, it's a modern building of course but it, it has a silhouette and I would even say uh, some kind of uh, the psychology of the building it seems to me rather gothic. I mean, look, if you compare it to the buildings around it, you understand that it's a different, even a different conception of what architecture is or could be or should be, what life is or could be or should be. Uh, he had big troubles to, to have it built because for many years he did the project, I think more than 10 years ago, and, and uh, the, the construction was being postponed and postponed and postponed. I guess he needed uh, all kinds of signatures. In the end, uh, they started the construction. And you can see it's, it's quite a, it's quite a uh, tall building. Uh, and it's done now. I mean, all kinds of uh, you know, famous architects uh, built uh, these, uh, these towers. You'll see some more uh, very soon. But I like very much this building by Jean Nouvel. Uh, you see the structure. Again, here we are dealing with the same phenomenon. The disbelief in the predictable relationship between column and beam, between, between uh, uh, you know, a reason that uh, uh, is too self-confident and the reality of a city and, and uh, the realities of, uh, of the art of, of building, which are so different today. So in a, in, a, in a different way than Frank Gehry, for example, he problematizes the box, the prism. He still believes yeah, in the straight line, but he also believes in diagonals. And these diagonals are almost capriciously uh, ornamenting the facades. 
which are also uh, uh, themselves have deviations from the uh, uh, pure vertical. During construction, it was built. Uh, maybe even the grand opening took place already. Uh, you can see the Empire State Building and then, then his building. So this is the structure. I like it. It's an embroidered structure. It is embroidered, but uh, with a with a uh, with a kind of uh, in, in embroidery that that shows, in a way, the the almost the dilemmas of our time. And it, 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 it is the structure becomes almost ornamental, and 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 uh, uh, um, this is something worth thinking about. That we are in this uh, at this time. Uh, 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 Recon rec reconsidering the relationship between structure and ornament and capriciousness as well because certain decisions here probably initially were of a aesthetic uh, order uh, and so there is a capriciousness sometimes that that is is, is beneficial because it brings uh, surprise in uh, in uh, even even in in the structure of the building it makes me, although that it's a different uh, architectural language, but somehow it, it makes me think this image to the Russian constructivists, the idealists, the utopians at the beginning of the 20th century. It's almost a paradox because here we have hardcore capitalism, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, intersecting or meeting. Uh, different kind of ide ideologies from more than 100 years ago or about 100 years ago and in, in, in uh, the Soviet Union or Russia. Uh, we'll see another very interesting skyscraper built not far away from this by shop. Very, very, very slim and very, very, very tall. I, 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 I like this building by, by Jean Nouvel. Stephen Hall Library. Now we come back to Stephen Hall. This is a library that opened very recently uh, and it provoked some scandal because apparently they ignore the architect and the beneficiary, the access of the people with disabilities. But the building is interesting, at least aesthetically. Here it was still during the construction, but uh, Stephen Hall very interestingly made his openings into the box uh, unfortunately, the entrance into the building, I think, is problematic. It's too, uh, it's just a, a little door almost, you could say, without, so it, it's, it, it's, it's a little bit strange, but I don't know if I have a picture so you can see what I'm talking about. But it's very interesting how he creates these openings in the facade, which are obviously plastic gestures. They are, they are, uh, you know, they, they show uh, an aesthetic freedom that maybe, you know, I don't know, uh, Juan Miro uh, exhibited in his art, but, you know, architects don't do it very often. But why not? This is a public building. You actually can see the door I was telling you about here. It's a door, but it's, I don't know. Um, anyway, but I, I, I admire these large windows, uh, these openings that probably are connected with the public spaces inside, mainly the circulations. I know there is a stair that you, you can walk from the bottom of the building all the way up, and I imagine these large openings are connected with, uh, just like in the case of the building by Diller and Scofidio, uh, uh, the, the openings are connected with also with circulation. Watercolors again that that connect with uh, uh, you know like the, the children's carpet and this is um, uh, I, I like this very much that Stephen Hall finds time, well, he makes time for these watercolors. So his artistic side is continuously uh, uh, present and active. That's him. <laughs> uh, 
writing something on um, you know on a panel there and during the construction what is even more amazing that this man who builds a lot who draws a lot who i understood wakes up in the morning uh, uh, starts to paint also found, found found time to become a father for the first time i think at 72 or 71 and he became now he or he's he is to become again a father, 73 or 74. It's unbelievable. Anyway, uh, yeah, he was sued and also the, the beneficiary by, uh, I don't know what organizations in New York, because they didn't provide uh, access for disabled persons. And this is a big issue. But the building is very interesting, and, and the critic of the New York Times considered it, considers it one of the, the most interesting buildings and significant architectures built in New York uh, the past, I don't know, 10, 20 years. Here he is in his office um, with Zaha Hadid. Uh, I was, I was once, I don't think he moved because I remember the shelves, this metallic uh, shelving system. I was in his office many, many years ago. He was not, he was not yet so famous. Uh, and I think he even lived there. And I remember seeing on the shelf uh, two books uh, that uh, attracted my attention. One was The Geometry of Art and Life by Matila Gika. And the other one was the sacred and the profane by uh, um, Mircea Eliade. But what, what disturbed me a little bit was that in his toilet, he had in front of the, of the toilet a little drawing by Aldo Rossi. Why did he place it there? I do not know, but, but that's where it was. Santiago Calatrava, he had to be there in New York as well. Um, of course, uh, the transportation hub, which is uh, an emphatic, almost flamboyant uh, celebration of an optimism, which seems a little bit uh, uh, almost out of place. Um, but this is the techno-mannerism or techno-expressionism of, of Calatrava. He repeats over and over again a certain kind of doing architecture and uh, uh, some people actually consider that the building is threatening, although it is white, but these, uh, these emphatic wings are maybe too emphatic uh, in the post-September um, uh, 11 uh, times. Uh, anyway, it is Santiago Calatrava. He also built a, a Greek Orthodox church, and you'll see it. Uh, soon, uh, also not far away from this uh, uh, transportation hub. Yes, it is very impressive, but when you think about, uh, uh, the, you know, the, 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 in the building has a, a, this, this, uh, um, this flamboyance, this uh, excessiveness, which uh, I don't know, we, we, we can talk about it. It is impressive, of course, as an engineering piece, but in terms of, uh, of its meaning, maybe it's, uh, it is lacking. After all, what is the big reason for this big gesture of uh, immense uh, pride, you know, the eagle or the bird in flight or... Uh, I don't think our times permit for... for, 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 for uh, an optimism of such a magnitude expressed so flamboyantly in, in architecture. After all, it's a transportation hub, it's not a cathedral, it's not, a, you know, it's not aspiring towards God or something, it's, it's, it's a transportation hub. This does not mean, of course, that a transportation hub has to be, uh, you know, uh, pale and uh, prosaic, but on the other hand, should it actually recall a cathedral? I don't know. I have my reservations from this point of view, vis-a-vis Calatrava, although of course he's, a, he's an important architect. I'm not even commenting on the cost of this building and which could have been avoided while so many people in New York City and worldwide have nothing to eat.
I, I mean, uh, yes, I know aesthetics have a hard time sometimes to marry themselves with ethical problems, but uh, the excessive, excessive of, of our uh, excesses of our consumerism that uh, could bring us uh, to ruin uh, should be questioned. I think this is the Greek Orthodox Church, also designed by him, and uh, as you know, it's hard. It's hard to please the Greek Orthodox religion architecturally. He tried, and uh, that's what he got. Uh, this, this is what he did. Uh, it, it is a, it's still a, I mean, I, don't, I don't even know if I could say it's a Calatrava building, but it's a Greek Orthodox building that happened to be designed by Calatrava. Um, it kind of looks more interesting when it, it was during the construction. It's a static building, of course, because, uh, uh, you know, the religion almost asks for something like this. In a certain way, there is more exuberance and more uh, aspiration to so-called the absolute or the infinite in the transportation hub than in the church. Yes, Calatrava, Greek Orthodox Church in New York City. Thomas Hedwig the designer from England uh, who is very successful in the sense that Pardon? I don't hear you. Just go back. Ten pack geranium that is sold as one thing, one unit. One unit for ten pieces of geranium. You want to try that? Sorry. He has a geranium. What can we do so we don't hear the background noise? It's mangala egg. Butternut squash egg. Could you please turn off the, the microphone? Thank you. So Thomas Hedorick, uh, he has he had to arrive in New York City too, and he did something uh, provocative, but uh, also questionable. Well, well, I'll explain myself. I, I like very much this picture, uh, but unfortunately, this idea to bring the labyrinth and the contortions of uh, present day life and society from outside of the structure uh, uh, seem contrived, and uh, it's, it becomes actually it became actually a, a, an object, an architectural object, and you'll see it here of very large dimensions. On the right side here, it's a structure. Uh, built by a dealer of Scofidio uh, and Renfro. Uh, this one is an interesting building too because it has a part that moves. But this one in the center is uh, Thomas Hedorick, who didn't study architecture. He's a designer, but he's very, very busy now erecting buildings in Singapore, in New York, in London, everywhere. Now look, it's kind of a, I don't know, I, 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 I'm not very impressed by this structure, but probably the experience, I still hear a background noise. I, I don't know where it comes from. Anyway, um, it, it was very interesting during construction, and I hope I have here some pictures showing the big segments that were manufactured at a different site and brought, brought in, this is a huge, building uh, to be explored by foot on, on these interlocking, intermingled stairs. But from the outside, it seems deterministic. It seems now rigid. Uh, it's like, uh, I, I like it when it is disordered like this during construction, but that's not how it is in the final, um, in the final image. It's almost it's almost like uh, some kind of uh, architectural Christmas tree upside down. But but the, there are still uh, possibilities to to take interesting pictures like this one. Um, and it must be a, it is probably an interesting experience to walk up the, these stairs if you have uh, strong legs and, uh, and the, uh, see the city uh, from these platforms. Here is the man with his, um, with his um, structure. Yeah.
it is again to be seen and to be uh, witnessed this simple fact if you take risks you might lose but you could also win if you don't take risks uh, you lose for sure so he took risks and look at him now he is one of the most uh, busy architects in the world because he had the courage to uh, assert uh, a certain vision about what he did and uh, it paid off in his case Herzog and de Moron, of course, they had to be here too, uh, with this building on the right. These New Yorkers, they don't care too much about earthquakes. They don't have earthquakes, so cantilevered uh, parts of the building are uh, welcomed. It's not a, a new form of aesthetics. Other people play with um, in this way too. Is not, they are not the only ones, but this is their building. And it is a departure from the plain boxes uh, surrounding it. What, what disturbs me a little, and not that they care too much that I am disturbed by this, but I do have to say something. To own uh, or to rent, uh, I imagine they don't even rent, but to own an apartment in this building is immensely expensive, immensely expensive. In, in Manhattan, you cannot rent a studio with maybe under $2,000 a month. And so, you know, we are dealing here with a financial elite uh, that is able to, to acquire these spaces. But what about the many who have a big, big, big trouble to rent a space. Uh, we are not even mentioning, uh, you know, buying a place. Uh, this fact that the stars of today very rarely address the problem of social housing, and I'm not a social worker, but I do admire the first moderns at the beginning of the 20th century who also had social concerns. They also had aesthetical concerns and they, they were innovators, but they also had some of them interest in, in, in uh, you know, so-called the common man, the common people. Not so often uh, the stars of today. I do not know of social housing. It happened that Herzog and de Moron did something in Vienna, but very unskillfully. But uh, Frank Gehry, did he ever do social housing? Did uh, Zaha Hadid do uh, social housing? Did uh, Rem Kolhas do social housing? No. They stay away from, uh, um, you know, the, the difficulties that such a program uh, um, is connected with. So I think this is a minus, but we still have to acknowledge what they offer because they are interesting architects and they build interesting buildings. Well, this one maybe is a little bit less interesting than other, uh, others, but uh, it, it's, it's a firm that is not to be ignored, as you know. But there is some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, indulgence in, in the financial reaches of the few that disturbs me a little bit. You know, uh, yes, we are playful. Yes, we are hedonistically oriented. Yes, we celebrate technology in all its glory. But with what price and for whom? I mean, you can only imagine how much it costs the penthouse in this building, but not just the penthouse. Any apartment is not meant for, you know, so-called uh, ordinary people. So there is, in a way, some kind of a superficiality and frivolousness in these, uh, in these uh, architectural gestures, which ignore, uh, I would say, a large segment of the population. This mundane architecture, uh, um, I find uh, problematic and uh, it surprises me that architects so, uh, you know, uh, skilled uh, are not a little more reticent about this or address problems that are not uh, uh, just about, uh, you know, uh, viv vivacious uh, architecture or uh, you call it as you wish. You see here in this picture on the right, the new World Trade Center by David Child, and then uh, the tower, Herzog and the Moron. 
I mean, many people in these buildings, these brick buildings, live here. They struggle in very small spaces. I know because I live there. I know what it means to pay a rent in one of these small spaces. And then here come Herzog de Moron, build um, a rather arrogant tower that celebrates the power of money uh, to which have access just a few, actually. And mainly who? You know, speculators on Wall Street and all kinds of people involved in, social, in financial transactions. Certainly not blue-collar blue collar workers, certainly not the nurses and even the doctors who, you know, fought the pandemic and so on. So uh, the, the capitalism, uh, as it is manifesting itself in New York City and uh, in, in other many parts of the world, I think has to be questioned. The inside, in a way, shows uh, the emptiness of an existential horizon that is conditioned by money. I mean, uh, you know, it's almost cynical, actually, because it's a very, very, very expensive building, but the look seems to be almost arte povera, unadorned walls, you know, cold, uh, concrete uh, aesthetics, uh, some kind of uh, misleading minimalism, because actually to live in this building, you cannot have an empty, uh, empty pocket and uh, you cannot be at the financial level uh, a minimalist at all. And then this uh, ubiquitous, uh, you know, uh, health club or, uh, I don't know, they, to be honest with you and forgive my, my harsh word, but they sicken me this, you know. It's, we take the car, like, like it was said, in the United States, you take the car, to go to the health club in order to ride the bicycle which goes nowhere. So it's absurd. We pollute the air with our cars and then we find refuge in the health club in order to ride, ride a, a bicycle like you see the, the background on the right side, which goes nowhere. It is totally absurd. And this, uh, this uh, 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 you know, preoccupation, eugenics, you know, with the, the healthy body, the muscles, the, the, it's so superficial, really. It only shows actually the emptiness of today's life because yes, you make money, yes, you buy the bank house, and then what do you do? You descend in the health club uh, and then you begin to activate your muscles uh, in a kind of a futile and ridiculous way. I, I, I don't know about uh, this so-called uh, well-being um, centers and then the, the you know the the swimming you know the swimming to cleanse oneself of one's sins i don't know maybe i'm now in a mood of uh, criticizing uh, certain things but the the, the, the paradigms that i see here uh, externalized architecturally leave me cold although i might contradict myself because as you can see i'm not cold at all that is i'm not indifferent maybe i'm jealous no, I'm not jealous. I, I don't think uh, this, this uh, lux calme volupte, to use uh, Charles Baudelaire's words, is such a great addition to our life, to which, in fact, very few people have access. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, privi it's a place of privilege. And, uh, you know, you have here, the, again, very gray and very, very misleading, actually. Where are the primary colors? Where is the joie de vivre? chromatically speaking. No, we have this, because in a way the psychology of the creators works in a, you know, maybe, maybe predictable way. You try to oppose the opulence of the buildings through these uh, apparently morose aesthetics. So you give the impression that there is no opulence here, but actually there is. Very much so. You cannot, you cannot even dream of, of, of uh, entering this building or uh, living there because uh, the prices are immense. Now, PS1 experiments. This is an interesting place. PS1 is a former public school in Queens, which was transformed into an um, art center, a uh, contemporary art center, and they have very interesting exhibitions. And that's where even young architects manifest themselves through all kinds of experiments. And you'll see some of them now. And some of the architects who began there, who uh, um, started to, 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 to display their works there, became later on so-called famous architects. 
Uh, this is a uh, Young Architects Pavilion in 2017. So they invest in uh, so-called research, in experiments, and uh, sometimes they build them. How computer-aided organic architecture could change the city of the future. And you have this structure which I used in, uh, in, the, invitation, in the invitational text that I, I sent out. I like this building. I like that. I like the fact that uh, you know uh, high technology is used to kind of connect with, uh, with a primitive, uh, so-called primitive uh, form of building. So in a way, we could use the words of Su Fujimoto, primitive future here. So you have a brick that was created artificially through this, uh, sophisticated technology and compounds all kinds of, um, uh, I, I don't know the technical uh, data precisely, but you can find, that, find out about it uh, on the web. And then the, the architecture itself is both new and, and very old. And uh, I like this sort of uh, meeting uh, between uh, the so-called future and the so-called past. Dan, these are uh, mushroom bricks. They are what? They're mushroom bricks. And uh, could you, if you are so kind, could you uh, tell us something about the mushroom uh, bricks? Yeah, it's made with uh, the organic uh, bricks. And it's a very good response to a temporary pavilion just that's there for a couple of months because they, they began to grow some mold. They, you know, they wouldn't have lasted very long. But they're actually organic. Are they? Because I, I, I read that... Uh, um unless I didn't read carefully, that it's a very special, so, it, so they are organic. Yeah, it's an organic process, like similar to a mushroom. So they are called mushroom uh, bricks, yes? Yes. And uh, 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 I guess the word mushroom comes exactly from the fact that they are organic. No? Absolutely. I'll, t I'll try and pull something up as we speak. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I would appreciate it. Also, uh, you said it's uh, perishable, that it doesn't last for a long time. Um, it, it's strange. It means I didn't read very carefully because I, I, I was sure um, I have to be more careful about this because uh, I, I thought it was a brick that it was created artificially but I didn't notice this aspect that it is artificially created, but from organic matter. It's not like the typical brick made of clay, is it? No, it's not a typical brick. So is this material used in, uh, in, in construction uh, in other places? No, this was very experimental. Ah, so you do know about this specific building? That, uh, yeah, absolutely. My colleagues did this in New York. Are your colleagues? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, a, I, I'm astonished about the workings of change. I, I almost expect now to say I did it. I mean, not <laughs> me, but you. <laughs> no, not this one. Not this one, but you, you use this brick yourself in your work? No, but the, the idea here is, you know, maybe this brick could function for eight weeks and then decompose. You know, how tall can you go? How much risk? What if? So, so it's, 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 it's interesting. It's very circular economy, uh, organic. It's a lot of interesting directions. So you said it lasts for just eight weeks? No, this was the idea. Like, you know, what can you do? You, you have a function. It's an eight-week function, right? So you have to build something. Hopefully it's not, doesn't cost too much, not too difficult to build, but you know, you get a lot of bang for the buck. It's an interesting installation. And then eight weeks later, you have to take it apart and get rid of it. So what do you do? Yes. Thank you. It always helps to have uh, Bruce in the audience because uh, I mean, I, I admire this, in, you know, after we, we met that, um, you know, we, we need a, we need the knowledge of a, of a good engineer and uh, 
Bruce, you seem to, to know about, uh, you know, the newest uh, things in a way. I mean, this was from 2017. Maybe this brick was so-called invented uh, earlier. I don't know, but the structure was built in 2017. I'm a little bit nostalgic because uh, this PS1, you see now it belongs to the Museum of Modern Art. So it's almost like a branch of the Museum of Modern Art, but in Queens. Maybe you don't believe me, but uh, I was the first architect to show work at PS1 in 1985 or 86. I was given a corridor on PS1 and it was an experiment. There was a young uh, curator who said, Dan, could you please uh, do quickly an exhibition? So I did an exhibition and I even have some photographs, but not on uh, this presentation called Architecture and Consciousness. Um, now searching for wholeness, uh, and I, I, I painted the, the 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 walls of the corridor in in, in the four primary colors: uh, red, green, the yellow, and blue. Uh, or maybe it should have been, but I, I have a problem there with Newton that the opposite of blue is not yellow, but it's it's kind of an orange. Uh, so opposite colors, red and green, and then uh, almost opposite yellow and blue. And on each color, I place different kinds of projects of, of mine anyway. Um, yeah, it was at PS1, but, but PS1 at that time was not part of the Museum of Modern Art and it didn't have the glamour that it has now. I like this structure I, I, because it has this quality and I like the fact that uh, it was probably a computer technology that was used but also seems hand, hand made and I like the so-called imperfections and, and, and it, it, it seems alive, it seems, uh, it seems human somehow. So this is the mushroom, uh, mushroom brick uh, that uh, Bruce mentioned as being called the mushroom. I, I admire though the restlessness of the New Yorkers, you know, the, 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 this city that never sleeps, the city that never sleeps is, is continuously provoking the world with, uh, with the new experiments. With, so it's almost like a paradox, you know, at its highest capitalism also paradoxically turns almost against itself and becomes uh, uh, playful and uh, anyway. Could very, very well be a chapel, or I'm sure if Peter Zumthor built it, he would have been uh, applauded for this. This was just a pavilion at PS1. This is another work also at PS1. Again, the, the return of the ornament, which cannot be ignored. Another structure built there. You can see even here, this is a rendering, but you can see the, 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 the breaking of the box is the monster within, so to speak, who tries to break up the cube. It's not literally a cube, but uh, uh, you understand. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it almost makes me think about what Adao Ando said, that he wanted to do an architecture that inside was like Pir Piranesi and outside like Joseph Albers. So here you have the beast within, who tries to explode. In fact, I showed yesterday a building by Kopp Himmelblau that is very similar to the beast within, so to speak, that we see here, that, um, you know, uh, mini opera space that Kopp Himmelblau built. Hernan Diaz Alonso, who now runs SciArc in Los Angeles, uh, who was also the director of uh, uh, the program Excessive at the Institute of Architecture in Vienna. He is uh, eccentric and he is uh, Argentinian, and uh, he runs now, he is uh, responsible for a very famous book uh, school where actually our, our guest tonight, uh, Bruce, he taught there. Uh, so maybe he, he could tell us more about SciArc. I only knew Neil Denari, 
who was the director of the, of the school for a number of years, uh, but now is Hernan Diaz Alonso. He built this thing, also a PS1. He he's obsessed by Maya, this uh, software that uh, allows for such fluidities. I, I, Dan, I engineered this structure. You did incredible, <laughs> Bruce. Uh, the, I, you the, continue the, to the, amaze me. The, the incredible thing here, Dan, is that the idea is in exploring with Hernan this project were amazing and we were never able to take them further. Like you, you do something like this experimentally and it creates ideas where you could multiply the scale by a hundred. But um, the ideas are still there. They haven't been, um, and maybe I can share them at some point because I think they're really interesting ideas. You continue to amaze me, Bruce. I mean, I really didn't expect this. Uh, I, I, and yes, I think one day, or if not now, perhaps you could tell us more about this, about um, you know the ideas that uh, you worked with um, building this, and uh, you know your collaboration with Hernan and so on. <laughs> I don't know. It's up to you. I, I can go on, uh, but I'm very happy that uh, that we met, and I, I think you have a lot of a lot of things, interesting things to say. And so please consider making another presentation. Maybe we'll invite also Hernan Diaz Alonso one day. I do send messages to him, but he doesn't respond uh, anyway. Again, the New Yorkers, I love these New Yorkers, you know, who, you know, these are common people. They probably, most of them can, can't afford to, be, to live in the skyscraper by Herzog uh, and the Moron, but they are, uh, uh, I don't know, this diversity, this hybrid society, you know, people coming from all over the world. I live there, so I know what I'm talking about. It's something, I think, very moving in this almost uh, difficult to, to, to conceive uh, uh, togetherness. <laughs> I I still I look at uh, I look at this and I, I say you know here is Bruce he's uh, on Zoom now and and he did the, the without you the, this this thing would not have been I mean I don't think Hernan would have been capable uh, of it's it's not that complicated but you uh, know in, com in competing for the work I sent one of my guys from the New York office to the comp to the to the interview and I think having um, Having Arab sit there, nod their head, and say, "Yeah, we got it. We'll do it. It'll be on budget. It'll work. Don't worry. It's okay." But you know, in the end, there's yeah, they can leave a bit, but they, it's not. There, there's nothing. There's no rocket science behind the structure here. <laughs> for me, it is Bruce. Sorry to say it. <laughs> I mean, uh, and I think it's also for Hernan. I don't think he could have done it. Oh, what's it, yeah, and what, what's what's really interesting is the ideas that come out of these explorations and I think that's part of I would you know from my perspective that's part of the purpose of PS1 is to instigate things to test things and then you know go out in the real world and do something big with it yes yes we'll see soon the works of shop and they also started at PS1 and I think I have images with a pavilion they did before they became the big firm they are now with uh, Greg Pasquarelli and, and his partners. But I know for you, you could say it's not a rocket science, but I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad that you think it's not such a big deal. I, to me, it's, uh, I mean, even to draw it is, 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 is not an easy matter. Shop, we arrive at shop. Now shop, are, uh, uh, the, the letters there are the, the, the initials of the, of the members of the group. There are actually two friends and their wives, and then there is another one. There are five people, I think, but only four letters. Anyway, the last letter belongs to Pasquarelli. They all studied at Columbia University in New York, and uh, um, Pasquarelli is probably the most um, innovative there, or, although I, I am not sure, but I think I think so, uh, Greg Pasquarelli, and uh, they have now, uh, they built uh, big buildings uh, and uh, not just big. So it, it's a very, uh, you know, 
know, important firm uh, in, in, in architecture. But this is a pavilion they built when they were very young. It happened that I actually, after they finished their studies at Columbia, I knew someone who was friends with them and one evening we were invited to a party and they just rented an apartment uh, on the east side of Manhattan, lower east side. And I remember they had a, a, a how do you call it, a, a pool, uh, this, this table where you, where you play uh, with, with balls. I don't know how it is called. Uh, anyway, uh, and uh, they were very into uh, using the co the computer to um, to generate forms that that actually appear very free and appear almost uh, you know ad hoc and spontaneous. But uh, uh, behind them th there was maybe scripting and programming. So this pavilion I admire because it. it, it it's almost like achieving freedom within order. And uh, uh, there are numbers behind this, um, you know, playfulness, aesthetical playfulness. I, I think it's a, it's, it's a good pavilion. And uh, I, I actually uh, uh, I am sad a little bit that some explorations that went on into this, this uh, building uh were kind of left behind but maybe it's explainable because they do now big commercial uh, buildings and uh, uh maybe it's not so possible to to have this kind of exploration at, at, at the level of high uh, you know large scale uh, buildings um so shop By the way, Greg Pasquarelli was asked maybe one or two years ago, what do you recommend um, young architects and students? And he said, on one hand, theory, history, philosophy, and on the other hand, uh, the newest uh, uh, digital technologies, uh, you know, scripting and programming and so on. And I, I believe he's not far from, from from what is needed to be done by, by maybe by anyone, but the, the, the young ones, those who begin working in architecture, perhaps should consider what he said. History, theory, philosophy, and on the other hand, meaning theory, you know, the theory uh, assumed in, in all its complexities, and then on the other hand, to know very well uh, digital technologies. I wonder, Bruce, if you are still here with us, um, what do you think of this? Do you think it's crucial that the students and the young architects know how to operate, to how to work uh, digitally at, at, you know, at so very sophisticated levels? Yeah, Dan, it's a, it's a really tough question because there's so much to learn. Like. Um, you know, you have to give something up to learn something new in, in the education. You can only put so much, um, you can't put 10 pounds in a five pound bag. It's just, so, so what do you give up? Like, do you give up some of the sketching courses? And when we talk about mind body, um, the digital is, is all mind, no body. And so we just need to be careful. I'm a little bit old school, so I'm really not the right person to ask. Well, you don't seem to me too old school. After all, you did the engineering for this pavilion by Hernan Diaz Alonso. 15 years ago, right? Yeah, <laughs> but, but no. I... A lot has changed, and um, it's, there's a, I think it's, I don't, I don't know if it's a new paradigm, but it's, it's certainly stronger that, that there's the opportunity that, that um, young architects and engineers coming out of school can reverse mentor people like me that don't have the, the skills or the techniques to, to, to use these digital tools. Um, I, I fear that there's a lot of, there's too much intelligence, too much smartness in some of the scripting and not enough wisdom. 
Now, Bruce, you, if you allow me, you said something extremely important, I think. And maybe we should just stop the presentation and just have a discussion, those of us who are here now about this. So you said, you know, in the scripting, there is too much smartness and not enough wisdom. And I remember what um, the, the great uh, Romanian sculptor Brancusi or Brancus said. He said, I, I, adore, I adore the intelligent ones, but I despise the smart ones. And I'm very glad that you mentioned this, Bruce, and, and the way you said it, in simple terms, you touch upon a very important uh, matter, I think, because, you know, there is an obsession now in the world, and not just in the United States, with smartness, smartphones, smart cities. Everybody talks about smartness, but very few people talk about wisdom or talk about uh, uh, intelligence and there is a difference between intelligence and, and smartness and I think we should address this subject because smartness it, it is dragging us into superficiality and banality and even uh, vulgarity while true intelligence is connected with wisdom and maybe even with a sense of limits I appreciate the modesty of Bruce I think he knows more than than uh, than he says it but I think, I think, yeah, we could talk about this. The, uh, my first question about, uh, you know, uh, the, the appropriateness or the need for, uh, for uh, knowing the, the, the newest technology derives from the fact that uh, the schools of architecture here, they still study more than two years, actually, with a 2T square and a rectangle. So, it's very hard to do a pavilion like shop, not to speak about the, um, um, you know, what uh, Hernan Diaz Alonso did, uh, PS1 and, and Bruce helped him. How could you do that with a T square and a rectangle? But maybe, maybe there is a wisdom that uh, uh, is worth uh, talking about, even in that so called turning one's head uh, backwards. I, um, I admire the avant-garde. Uh, I thought I was part of it myself, uh, but I also uh, am uh, affectionate towards, uh, um, uh, you know, a past which uh, which um, doesn't pass. I mean, didn't die and doesn't die. So anyway, this is uh, maybe one day we should meet uh, and and talk about these issues without without any kind of presentation. Just talk about these issues because uh, I think they are important. Um, anyway, I will move forward. So this is. Yeah, the I of mentioned the T square yesterday, um, um, and I only have a few more minutes. But I, I just want to add a thought there: is that there's something wonderful about the T square as it forces you to use your body to create your design, not just your mind. So okay. what can we what can we do with the body, especially when there's sort of a I think there's a transition in the design process where when you're creating something in the beginning it's very open um, and you can use a computer a bit but you should rely on other techniques like physical models and sketching and drawing and then transition to more of the computer as as because it's very the computer is very constricting in uh, well. I, like you said, we can get into this some other time. I have a lot of thoughts with, to share with us. Yes, uh, uh, I am very, very curious and interesting to have uh, such a discussion and will invite a larger community. Uh, and I, I'm very happy that, that this subject interests you. It is true. How do you bring the body into a work that is increasingly uh, alienating the body? Um, it's a very legitimate uh, concern. Yes, we, we should come back to it and very soon and maybe several times. So, um, the Berkeley Center also by shop. Uh, Bruce, please do not tell me that you also did a structure for this as well. No, I had nothing to do with this and I'm going to leave in, a, in about two minutes, to, um, no, five minutes. So, I'm, I'm not going to interrupt you anymore, Dan. No, no, the, uh, your, your interventions are not interruptions. I, I wouldn't use this word. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, this is in Brooklyn. Uh, it's a big arena. Of course, uh, the in most interesting part is in the front of the building, this, uh, you know, uh, canopy with a big hole in it. Um, these towers are also by shop and they are kind of interesting. It's almost like a commentary on the, uh, the former World Trade Center. Uh, it's, they are the so-called the dancing towers and uh, someone here expressed his belief that they, 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 they were able to do this, to break the prism on the left uh, and then have, have that bridge between the two, the, two, the two buildings, which are also, as you can see, a little bit uh, sloping. Um, so I imagine the engineering was, uh, it's called the American Copper Buildings. I think it's a good work by them. Um, if I'm not uh, rushing into a statement here. Now, at least in these buildings, from what I read, they have a section of the bu in both buildings where they also rent to people with a uh, lower income. But I guess those with a higher income, you know, pay pay for uh, for those. But that's good. I think it's more. Uh, balanced uh, the situation where you have two groups of people the the the, the privileged ones and and the, and the disadvantaged ones kind of coming together and and complementing each other in some way I, I i don't know i don't want to idealize it because i i have my own uh, uh, prejudices in a way against uh, rampant uh, capitalism but it seems something good was happening here and i don't know if the architects had a role in this but I know that shop, I know Pasquarelli and I know his wife and I know the other people. I think they are, they are not arrogant and I think, although they build uh, some of the most eccentric and expensive buildings in New York, I also think they have some sympathy or empathy for those um, less, uh, less advantaged by, by destiny, let's say. Yes, in a, with a certain conditions of light, uh, the buildings uh, begin to, to, to show the, the value of copper. Now, this is a building uh, by them, which is uh, amazingly inefficient because it's, it has a footprint very, very narrow. Uh, look at it, it's very tall and very, very narrow. So it's almost like a rod, uh, extremely tall and thin. And uh, uh, I just don't believe it that these, uh, these uh, they are still young. S, capital H. Uh, Hello? Capital. Okay, so the building is uh, facing uh, Central Park. Somewhere here on the left side, uh, John Lennon was shot to death. I think at 72nd Street or so on the west side of Central Park. Here is the notorious uh, Central Park uh, East. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I even forgot how it is called. Anyway, this is the west side. This is the eastern side. And many times I cross this park and it, it's a nice walk from one side to the other going through the park. But it is advisable not to do it at night. Uh, you see the advertisings of Capitalins to mer tomorrow's Today's glass ceiling is tomorrow's first floor. Dare to dream. Well, <laughs> the truth is there to dream so we can get even richer. Because that advertising is, doesn't belong to the architects, but to the developers and the, you know, the real estate uh, people. I think here is just one, one apartment per floor, so you can imagine. You can imagine, I saw a building where Rafael Moneo was uh, uh, the design consultant and I just didn't believe my eyes. One apartment was, was valued at uh, 800 something million dollars. Can you believe it? I still don't believe it, although I saw it and I, I, I kept looking at it and I still don't believe it. Anyway, you see here clearly the, 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 the positioning of this tower vis-a-vis -vis Central Park and in general the, the city.
it, it, it has actually ceramic tiles uh, uh, that are incorporated in the facade with a kind of interesting uh, ornamental uh, design. I learned that some of them began to fall, but it's okay. Um, so there are ceramic tiles that adorn the facade. You see here that some parts fell off. So the facade is not simplistically just structure. It's also, it has an ornamental side that, that is present. Another tower in Brooklyn by them, uh, maybe started to, uh, is, uh, this is still Manhattan, but uh, is this one, which I think they are building now. This one here. Yeah, Brooklyn is getting tall, <laughs> taller and taller itself. Soon it will be another Manhattan. When I lived there, they didn't have such buildings. No. Anyway, again, Diller and Scofidio on Renfro, the shed. This is a building that is uh, recent and uh, it's uh, scandalous in a way. It's, uh, uh, it's flamboyant. Structure and technology uh, are involved, and, uh, and uh, at a scale uh, maybe of uh, old imperial Rome. You see behind the the the, the structure built by Thomas Heatherwick. Uh, Diller and Scofidio are also building now a skyscraper in the vicinity of these two structures. Now, you see it's mo it moves. It opens up and it amplifies the space. Maybe it doubles it. Uh, look. But the scale is, is huge. This one we saw. That's the tower they are building now, the one in the background. This is also a work by them, but it's uh, older. It was, I don't know, built, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so for the Lincoln Center. Also, at that time, they were just dealer at Scofidio. The New York High Line, which is very commented upon, but also their work, they uh, brought some nature and, uh, and, uh, and the walking uh, through Manhattan, uh, transforming this, uh, this uh, you know, railway into a, some kind of linear park. Interesting here in this picture, you see on the left, the provokers, of, uh, the makers of pollution and on the right, the revenge of the grass in a way, nature and man. On the left, the man, on the right, nature. Or to use the words of Frank Lloyd Wright, because when he was asked, do you believe in God? He said, I believe, I do, but I spell it nature. Now, uh, an interesting phenomenon, uh, talking about green and greening our lives uh, and, and our cities. Uh, um, the green returns now in New York, in Manhattan, even underground. And you will see an example. Uh, this is just an experimental work. Perkins Eastman Architects Green Line concept would see New York's iconic Broadway converted into, sorry, I anticipated the next work will be uh, about the, the green outside, in, uh, indoors, uh, underground. Now it's about something else, an attempt, a proposal to transform Broadway into a linear park, 
running from Columbus Circle to Union Square. That's about, I don't know, 80 streets or something like this. So you see, it's reclaiming the land for green, for nature. A very important uh, avenue, Broadway Avenue, of course, which inspired even, uh, even uh, Piedmont Mondrian. But here it is an attempt to, uh, to, 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 to balance the excesses of, of, of vehicular uh, movement with uh, some, some sort of uh, uh, linear park. And you can see here, it's a, it's a green spine, so to speak, a green, uh, a green uh, uh, insertion uh, into a city which uh, misses, uh, misses, I mean, it needs as much green as possible. But it's not just that it, the proposal uh, creates a, a park, but it also removes the, the, the functions of a, an important avenue which was dedicated mainly to, uh, to the car, to the vehicle. Of course, the, the sidewalks were used as well because in New York people still walk. And you see on the left, uh, a major, uh, almost uh, outrageous uh, proposal, but maybe very, very needed. So how would our cities look like if we begin to transform uh, certain avenues into, into linear parks? It's the revenge of, of nature in a way. And now the subterranean garden that I mentioned before, an experiment to bring even flowers underground where there is no natural light, when the, where there is no sunlight. So in a subway station, they created this the first underground park. Look at it. And, <laughs> you know, you could, I guess, have some kind of picnic uh, in the darkness. Well, not, not any longer darkness because light is brought in some way uh, underground. I understood that uh, high technology is used here to make flowers even bloom. This is how it used to be. And this is how it is now, at least at this experimental level. But you see the exasperation where we arrive at, because we try to, uh, uh, to compensate many years in which we abuse nature, in which we kill nature, in which we banish nature. Now with the with return of nature, even in the most improbable places, like uh, the underground of Manhattan. Uh, I don't know. It's 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 kind of strange now that that we cannot neglect for too long uh, uh, certain realities, and, and 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 the more we neglect them, and the more we suppress them, the more they will uh, return uh, with a with a, an increased power to, as I put it, to revenge themselves. So move over, rats. This was uh, an announcement relating to this experiment. Move over, rats. New York is planning an underground park. Move over, rats. New York is planning an underground park. That's because, indeed, uh, the subway system in New York has many rats. They are actually uh, there for all to see. So now the plant, the fragile, the vulnerable plant, is uh, is uh, is attempting to to fight with the misery that brought the rats there in the first place. Interesting. It shows again the New York spirit, the city that never sleeps, that it experiments. Yes, they make mistakes. Yes, they have incredible excesses. They, there are many things that are to be questioned, but we cannot question the vitality of this city. That that has the courage to even question itself. Back to architecture. Ah, I didn't know I'll have, uh, anyway, the new building of Cooper Union. I mentioned Cooper Union where uh, uh, Scofidio taught for many years, maybe he still does. Uh, and uh, Eisenman taught there, John Haydock was the dean and 
Tom Main from Morphosis uh, designed this building. It's an architecture school, a very famous one, Cooper Union, but this is the new building by, uh, it was built a few years ago by Morphosis, by Tom Main an architectural, architectural firm from the west side of the United States, um, uh, Los Angeles. And then uh, um, we have the museum by Sana, uh, Kazuyo Sejima and her partner. It's perhaps not a glorious building, but um, anyway, it's built by a, a woman architect who received the Pritzker Prize herself. Here she is with her partner, whose name I continue to be unable to pronounce. And now we see a quotation from an important modern painter, Francis Picabia, who said, New York is the cubist, the futurist city. It expresses in its architecture, its life, its spirit, the modern thought. And then there is uh, this quotation from Simone de Beauvoir, there is something in the New York air that makes a sleep uh, makes sleep useless. There is something in the New York air air that makes sleep useless. <laughs> it's probably true. And this, uh, unfortunately, picture and quotation with a low resolution, but I like the way uh, what it says. Most cities are nouns. New York's a verb. Indeed, New York is a verb in the continues to be a verb because of its verb, verb, V-E-R-B-E, -E, uh, -E, and its uh, activism and its, uh, its continuing searching for, for, uh, for something else. Never give up on your dreams. I love this. And I think we should, we should say the same thing to ourselves. Never give up on our dreams. Not on your dreams, but on our dreams. And this is the probably... I don't know, the last picture with, uh, yes, the right excess is here, all these tall buildings uh, springing to, to the sky. But something maybe similar happened also in San Gimignano in Italy uh, uh, some, some good centuries ago. Mountains in New York. This is a project, uh, the project that would involve digging down to reveal the bedrock hidden. It's a project by two young uh, architects who envisioned, you see, some kind of a return to a, some kind of a primeval, archaic uh, past where, city, where uh, um, Central Park disappears and uh, reveals something that maybe, maybe it was there before it and maybe a long time ago, some kind of primeval nature. It, it's another attempt to, to, to bring back what was lost we saw the flowers blooming underground in the subway station. Now we see mountainous, uh, uh, you know, uh, natural structures and valleys and hills and lakes replacing the, the city hall, the, no, sorry, the, 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 the Central Park. So it is, it seems uh, uh, we are trying to recuperate something that was lost. Uh, and that is, to put it simply, nature. In, in even its most uh, primal uh, uh, forms. And not accidentally, the cave returns in architecture also in an attempt to, 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 to recuperate, to reclaim something that uh, we forgot for a long time. Landlock, the 100 feet deep mega structure with boast 1,000 feet high walls, that's very high, which would encase the seven square miles of floor area. So I don't know about this, but that's what they proposed. You see the, this, uh, this uh, prehistorical uh, natural uh, site they, they proposed to create is surrounded by these reflecting uh, walls that are, uh, you know, uh, 1,000 feet high, quite high. But we are talking about New York City. So I guess they have to be high. I don't know. The Mammoth Project was designed by Yitan Sun Sun and Jian Shivu, who 
scooped first prize for the entry in the Evolo skyscraper competition. And that was it uh, with, um, with uh, uh, New York is rising again. I don't know if you still have the patience and the power and I myself am a little bit tired to also talk now about twisted architecture. So what should we do? I, I could I could engage in uh, in, uh, in in this subject as well, but uh, I, are you up to it? We are. If you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the. Okay, I'll I'll go for it. Um, I'll try to defeat my maybe even melancholia to an extent. Anyway, so we start with twisted architecture, ar architectures. Uh, slideshow from the beginning and in a way this this subject complements the previous one Bernini in San Pietro of course we are talking now about uh, you know almost uh, 500 years ago uh, the great Baroque architect who uh, for the Baldac in, in San Pietro you could say he almost used uh, sophisticated digital technologies, but he didn't. Uh, it's very interesting and it still haunts me what Bruce said, and we are talking about a very innovative architect who is almost nostalgic towards some form of, uh, of past, you know. Um, anyway, I should not become nostalgic myself. So Bernini in San Pietro, uh, and then you see the relationship between Bernini and what is happening today. I mentioned already that Frank Gehry found inspiration in Bernini, but it's not just Frank Gehry, also Yaman Song, uh, Mayan Song uh, from uh, Med Architects. Um, now, uh, the subject is twisted architecture. This is a photoshopped image, but it shows still and it is an attempt to 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 twist architecture to dislocate it to to make it dynamic even beyond the the the, the stringencies of, of reason now we have Meve de Reve proposing this uh, tower i think in austria yes in vienna uh, i don't know if it will be built but uh, they proposed it and you can see it it brings in uh, the the disturbance of twisting the building and and, and uh, distorting it uh, uh, almost at the point of uh, uh, of breaking it. It's almost like the building is saying, "Well, I am going upwards, but uh, I'm not so sure I should." But this kind of erosion, because this is what it is, an erosion takes place uh, in uh, various architectures, uh, some of the most uh, interesting and, and celebrated deal with this, this kind of erosion. And I'm not sure in this case we could call it uh, positive erosions, like for example, we could call uh, something somehow similar in the Brion Cemetery by uh, Carlos Carpa. Uh, which is a much smaller work, of course, in terms of dimensions. Now, Ingel, of course, with his park in Norway, this, um, not park, bridge, the Bridge Museum, uh, which is very well crafted, but, um, well, as somebody told me, it's not a wise building, and maybe it is not, but you cannot be indifferent to it. It's interesting that exactly above the water, exactly above the the middle of the river, it, uh, it twists. And in a certain way, I think he chose correctly because what is the middle of a bridge? Is that that point where you move from one state to another, from ascending to descending? It's, it's almost like the middle life crisis of a human being. So I think there is some legitimacy to the act of twisting and distorting the, the, the structure exactly in the middle.
Now this is the project. Uh, it wasn't realized quite like this. The, the wall doesn't, the glass wall doesn't really become, uh, you know, a glass uh, terrace or roof, but uh, it's it's very similar. I'm still haunted by, by the reticence of Bruce Danziger, the, the engineer who was with us, because he works for, for Ove Arup, for a famous, maybe the most famous engineering firm, and, and they, they build uh, very innovative structures, but he seemed nostalgic and, uh, you know, uh, sentimental towards, uh, I have to think about it. Anyway, we move forward with uh, Ingels and Twisted Architectures. Look at the plan. Uh, but maybe in that very distortion in the middle of the building is expressed some kind of doubting in a way. It's a Hamletian nature, uh, uh, Hamletian gesture in a way, you know, uh, right there in the center. It could have crossed the bridge without any kind of hesitation or twisting or distortion, but it doesn't, it didn't. And, and, and Ingels uses uh, twisting all the time. I imagine that's him there, you know, trying to seduce more possible clients and explaining to them in a rhetorical and uh, vivacious way <laughs> how things are or should be or could be. He's a good salesperson, no doubt. Med Architects, the Wood Museum in China, Young Architects. Mai Yan Song was the founder, and now he has some partners. Uh, so they built a building that is not dissimilar to the building uh, which I saw by Ingels. It's a large uh, wood museum that was actually inspired by a piece of wood and you are going to see it. And you see, even, even the plans are not very different, truly, from, uh, from what Ingels did. This is the piece of wood that apparently inspired the design of this wood museum. Some cross sections. The twisting towers in Miami by big again, Ingalls again, they are twisting themselves, all right. Uh, the structure is done um, in astonishing ways, you know, where are the columns? Uh, he collaborated with an Italian engineer and apparently was, um, was a good collaboration and, uh, and uh, a very good engineer, I forgot his name. So this presentation is just a survey of twisting structures, twisting architectures. I kind of go quickly, maybe all of these projects deserve further study, but this is a, a, you know, a, uh, an overview of, of, of this uh, subject, of this theme, as expressed in, uh, in, uh, in architecture. I have in other presentations more detailed uh, you know, remarks on, on this building or on these buildings. Now in Vancouver, you with the Vancouver house, which was finished kind of recently, and I liked his explanation. Ingel said that it's like a building is like a curtain, you know, on, a, on the stage of a theater or an opera house, which which opens a little bit, so the stage opens up to the to the, the audience, and and the audience is is you know visually at least invited uh, towards uh, towards the stage. It's an interesting idea because it's the entrance into Vancouver, Vancouver, and uh, yeah, it's done with uh, an impressive technology, but. The legitimation, the legitimacy of of his gesture is not. Uh, 
as, it's not uh, it's not without being uh, um, viable i think you can see the 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 highway is it's almost like the building is suggesting you are exiting the city or you are entering the city I knew about this project that they had some, Pardon? Yeah, that they had some uh, restrictions. Uh, that is why that um, the plan, uh, the floor plan is so much smaller than uh, what is happening above. That's not what I read about him. That he, but, uh, it's very possible, yes, there were some restrictions, but that his explanation was not so physical, was rather metaphysical. And you can find the, the quotation I was referring to on the web in various places. Uh, yes, probably they had some, some restrictions, but, uh, and, and they, they were probably, uh, um, uh, they had to be considered, but it was also the other explanation that, that I just mentioned. So what I'm trying to say is uh, the, the decisions of an architect if he is honest, uh, are not always uh, just functionalist and prosaic and, uh, and uh, you know, countable. I mean, they are not just about so-called facts, but they are also about, uh, uh, you know, uh, mental attitudes. Uh, I'm not trying to neglect the, the so-called physical constraints, but I don't think the architectural gesture can be justified or explained or sustained just with uh, so-called facts, just with um, you know measurable uh, uh, you know uh, data. Uh, I was actually referring to the uh, city design restrictions because uh, they are only allowed to uh, to build a certain uh, um, um, surface on the ground, and that is why that they. Uh, um, while they elevated their, they, um, they grew in the surface. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't think we can justify his architectural decision to twist the building just because the footprint of the building couldn't go beyond a certain uh, number of square meters. Uh, no, I mean, he could have done a prism just like the one on the right. He didn't have to torment the building in this way. Uh, uh, no, here it is also, again, the architect also has his own subjectivity, uh, his aesthetics, his uh, sense of, uh, you know, uh, appropriateness in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, also how the building looks like. So we have a twisting here that takes place vertically, while, while at the museum in Norway, it took, it took place horizontally. It's the same architect, the same mental attitude, the same twisting, except that here is vertical and there it was horizontal. Now, in the forests of Norway, there, are, there were no urban restrictions. Why did he twist that structure? Here you could say, okay, maybe you are right. Maybe there were some constraints, but I think it's not just that. I'm not trying to dismiss um, the, the, the possibility that these constraints uh, did exist, but I think it's also the, you know, the, the mental, uh, the emotional, uh, you know, positioning of the architect vis-a-vis -vis his, uh, you know, his oeuvre, his, his work. Anyway, it's an it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting building. I'm sure it was done with effort, but uh, well, he did it. But you do see somehow what he mentioned that it's almost like a building that opens up that doesn't block uh, at the visual level the entrance into Vancouver. That it, yeah, like a curtain. You know, it it divulges part of what the stage uh, has to offer. So the building is slightly uh, insinuating the realities behind it, the urban realities, that's, that's the city. Absolute Towers by Med Architects. Uh, I, I showed the Bernini uh, with the ba uh, Baldac in, in uh, San Pietro 
Now you have these uh, young uh, Chinese architects. Well, he, he, he studied in, at Yale in the United States. Then he worked a little bit uh, for Zaha Hadid. And then he opened in China uh, Med Architects. And these are the towers. With the same, I mean, it's their similarity to the um, to what Bernini did is uh, almost unavoidable. Uh, it's amazing again that that these architects were able to build something like this, being very young. They are still young, uh, and it's the same kind of attitude. You twist the spree, uh, the prism. You twist the, 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 you, you twist and distort reason, and there must be a reason why you do this. And I think the reason is a certain disbelief, a certain pessimism vis-a-vis -vis the, the legitimacy of, a, of a, an exacerbated reason or Cart Cartesianism. We also try to bring in some, something organic, something... Uh, uh, you know, more fluid, something more mysterious in a way. In a way. Now, this is uh, another elegant twist, uh, kind of similar to, I mean, you, you can uh, discern without difficulty some mannerisms in the case of Big and Ingalls. Um, uh, he's still able to reinvent himself and, and his company, but, but there are certain formal themes that, that are kind of obvious. This is just a project was not built. Now Kopp Himmelblau at BMW, uh, big uh, flamboyant building. Here we have this twisting all right again. Um, uh, yeah, it's hard to do twist too much twisting for social housing. But if you build for BMW, uh, of course you can because uh, you know you are advertising the company through the building, and they have all the money in the world to build this extravaganza. But the quest for the vortex, for the uh, for the turbulence, because that's what it is. It is an architectural tur turbulence, although it is a metallic one, and, and I have a problem here because it. They are cold. I also saw the uh, uh, Le Musée de Confluence in, uh, in Lyon, uh, also done by Kopp Himmelblau. Yes, the volumes are interesting. Yes, the spaces are interesting. But the materials, the tectonics of the building uh, of the, is also uh, cold and it's mono, uh, some kind of a mono tectonics. I mean, it, the shapes are organic, but the materials are not. The Martin Luther Church by Kopp Himmelblau, um, and here there was a Romanian young architect who works for Kopp Himmelblau, and he did the roof, the roofing, which is the most interesting part, at least in terms of visuality. I'm talking about Daniel Bojenaru. Uh, he worked, he did this through his... Uh, uh, high skills in uh, in the field of um, you know scripting and programming. Uh, so this look at the old church on the right and look at this is actually a church, but it is a turbulent church. It's a small church actually. Uh, I only have unfortunately just picture this picture now, um, but you can find a lot of pictures on the on the web. It's interesting that uh, uh, Wolf Prix, when he visited the, the school in Bucharest, uh, no, no, he, uh, in a, in a, for an interview published in South Korea, he was asked, what are the five uh, architectural uh, wonders or structures of the world that are a must-see by any student of architecture and any arch architect? And he said, the pyramids, of course, the Egyptian pyramids, the Temple of Hera in Pestum, uh, the Guggenheim uh, by Frank Gehry in Bilbao, uh, a, a plane he mentioned, uh, Boeing, I don't know, I'm not very good, I think 747, so a plane. And the fifth one was this very church that he built in his native town in Austria. Now, when he visited the school in Bucharest, I asked him, uh, uh, what about Pestum? 
because it's a very heavy building and very governed by, by gravitation. And he negated, he said, no, no, I never said Pestum, but uh, that's what I read in that interview in South Korea. Because his idea is that architecture will become more and more so-called non-gravitational. I don't know about that, but yes, the temple in Pestum, uh, that pre-Doric uh, temple that moved uh, uh, Goethe, Winkelmann, uh, Piranesi and Louis Kahn, uh, uh, is not so uh, relaxed vis-a-vis -vis gravitation, so to speak. Anyway, the central bank in Azerbaijan, again, Kop Himmelblau, but it's just a project. It was not yet done, as far as I know. Twisting here again. Um, then the book, uh, uh, another building by Ingels in Vancouver. Uh, no, it's actually the same one, sorry, that we saw that was already built. Um, Anyway, we move forward. A big designs with a twist in Miami. Uh, raise the bar for we saw this one. Uh, we saw it. It was built. And Rafael Moneo also built one. <laughs> not, Ra not Rafael Moneo. Sorry, uh, Kengo Kuma uh, built also in Florida two towers which are very similar to to what Ingels did. Strange this uh, Kengo Kuma because he also. Uh, designed and built uh, so the Olympic Stadium in Tokyo that Zaha Hadid claimed that he, he inspired himself heavily from her own project. I actually think the, the, the project by Zaha Hadid was superior in many ways to the one built by Kengo Kuma. Anyway, um, so new report ranks 28 twisting scrapers in the world right now and explains why there are many more to come. This is a building by SOM in, du in Dubai, twisting itself uh, all right. Um, then in Malmö, uh, Santiago Calatrava in Sweden built uh, some years ago this tower, which is not, which is not at all a uh, bad, uh, bad tower. I saw it. Uh, and it was built some years ago, and but it's 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 still convincing, and it's it's very well done. Twisting itself. Um, now, Studio Gang uh, with Ginny Gang, Twisty Tower in San Francisco, which is built. Uh, again, you kind of see a certain connection between uh, the tower I presented in the first presentation by Frank Gehry. Uh, this one is uh, contorted and uh, twisting. Uh, it's different than what uh, Frank Gehry did, but somehow pointing in the same direction. That, that architects are tired of, 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 of the prismatic, uh, placid, uh, quiet, uh, uh, you know, peaceful uh, box, and they want uh, they want some movement. So they invite Bernini to uh, inspire them, I guess. The Diamond Tower in uh, in the Arab world. I don't know. This is too explicitly spiraling and twisting. UN, they proposed and they won, and I think they are going to build it in Melbourne, these, these two towers that are twisting, facing each other. I think it's not a bad work, particularly because the twisting, uh, that face that, that is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other building is uh, greened by the presence of the plants. So you have this uh, rift between the two towers that, that allow for some kind of dialogue, which in this case is also uh, warmed up by, uh, by, by the pre presence of plants, of vege vegetation. Next week, we will have a chance to uh, have a presentation by a German architect who worked for UN for a number of years. Uh, 
uh, I think three years he worked for UN um, and he will make a presentation about his own work in Indonesia where he works with his partner, an Indo Indonesian architect. Uh, they met in the Netherlands where they studied in an excellent school, Berlache Institute uh, in Rotterdam. And then she started to work for uh, OE, OOM, uh, Office of Metropolitan Architecture, Rem Kolhas, and then uh, Meve de Reve, and then uh, West 8 while he worked for UN. So it will be interesting to, um, he probably didn't work for this project because this was done uh, recently, but it's very nice that uh, they, they want to, to make this presentation next week. And they have very, very interesting work uh, uh, built by them, you know, by them in, in Indonesia. Now the Morphosis Tower by uh, Tom Main and, 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 uh, and uh, Morphosis, uh, his, his company in Paris, too bad it was not built because I think it would have been an interesting addition to the landscape of tall buildings in Europe. It has two sides. It has the, the, this uh, fluid side on one, on, uh, yeah, on one side, sorry for the repetition, and then in the back is Cartesian. So this shows something about the dualities of Tom Main. He's an interesting architect. He received the Pritzker Prize himself. And he is also very involved with SciArc, the school in Los Angeles that is run by Hernan Diaz Alonso. I think this building would have been a provocative addition to the the tall buildings in Paris and in Europe in general. But for some reason, uh, it, it, the construction didn't start. Now, a tower by uh, Zaha Hadid, which is, I think, very elegant. And it's, it's, uh, it, it, it found a balance between um, movement and stability. I think it's an elegant tower and this is, is, is well done. I think it was finished after her death. Um, It has a purity that is an, an, an elegance which is not so present in other works by Zaha. And it's not so extravagant, actually. It's, it's, it's more gentle in a way. An interesting tower in Panama uh, with twisty, twisting and, <laughs> and spiraling, uh, all right, um, so explicitly maybe too explicitly, but it was built. I wonder what Bernini would have thought if he saw uh, these buildings. Now this is a project actually twisting itself and you can see some connections also with the tower in, uh, in Vancouver by Ingels. So there is a certain a generalized uh, uh, attitude vis-a-vis -vis, you know tall buildings that are twisted and in the case of the museum in the woods of Norway uh, also horiz horizontally not just vertically but these buildings belong to the present. Well, I don't know. It is, it's, a, it's a present uh, prior to the pandemic. I, I don't know if, if the climate change will accelerate and if uh, the pandemic continues to give us problems, it is possible that we might begin to twist less and less because uh, uh, this pandemic does, does force us to reconsider many things. And so does the climate change. This was not built. 
So the report says the trend will be around for some time due, due to its green friendly nature. I don't know. Twisting buildings can reduce energy consumed in the building via the more varied opportunities for the placement of windows. Just don't twist your neck looking up at them now. Anyway, this is the journalistic jargon. Uh, the truth is, I'm not so sure that you can justify uh, uh, you know, such uh, efforts, technological and financial efforts uh, with uh, so-called sustainability and ecological, eco eco ecological concerns and so on. It surprises me again and again that the comments are still kind of uh, ignoring the real reasons behind uh, this twisting, which have nothing to do, I mean, come on, uh, Ingels is not interested in sustainability, and, and many of these people are actually, uh, you know, uh, probably generally kind of indifferent. I, I don't think that this kind of twisting is uh, reducing energy. I doubt it. Anyway, the singing ringing tree. Uh, this is a sculpture uh, twisting itself uh, all right. Uh, maybe singing as well through those pipes. It's not very tall, you'll see the human being near it, but it's an interesting structure. Uh, the dean at Columbia University in New York for many years, about 15 years, Mark Wigley, who was the curator of the exhibition Deconstructivism in Architecture, he wrote a manifesto called Towards Turbulence, um, lately, it's, it's impossible, was impossible for me to f find it again on the web. Maybe he changed his mind. But we are, what we do see here is, is some kind of turbulence. It's an architectural tornado or a sculptural tornado. It, it, it almost looks like human beings got tired of the simple answers of uh, Cartesian, Cartesian uh, obsession. So now they... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, turn for for uh, some kind of compensation to tornadoes and uh, tormenting and tormented structures. This is a pavilion. This is a, 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 a reticent twisting, if I can call it so. It's discreet. It's uh, almost unnoticeable, but there is a twisting here too. It's a modest structure, but uh, it is twisted. Now this is a, a more uh, adventurous uh, twisting in Tallinn, uh, digital models and augmented reality. They created this uh, architectural tornado kind, kind of convincingly, I have to confess. It's not a big uh, structure, but uh, it is, it is, uh, it is, uh, <laughs> It is a, some kind of a you know, tornado, architectural tornado, a vortex as well. Uh, Ron Arad, he couldn't miss the chance to assert himself also uh, through in this, in this field in Tel Aviv for a tower twisted itself. Uh, maybe not so spectacularly, but there is a twisting taking place here as well. Now this is Photoshop, uh, but uh, I think it's worth contemplating why did an artist do something like this? And this is the last image of the, of the presentation, is a distortion, a twisting of the facade of the Cathedral Notre Dame in Paris, done by the one who just talked to you for about two hours or so. Okay, I thank you and uh, that's it. <laughs>